Well, it seems very odd uh, to me not to be introducing uh, Dr. Rodney Jackson, whom I've known for more than 30 years. Um, and now we have uh, some new leadership at, at the Snow Leopard Conservancy, Dr. Quinton Martins. So he, Quinton was working on uh, leopards in South Africa. Rod has that same sort of unusual accent that you've heard before. And, um, and he was recruited uh, to work on snow leopards, saved from working on these lowland cats. So uh, let's hear what Quinton has to say. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> testing, testing. That's good. The last, I, I was a keynote speaker at a conference last year, and it took me about half the talk to dislodge my tongue from my palate. So a little nervous, so um, excuse me for a second. Um, thank you for being here. It's a really great opportunity to address you. Uh, I've got some good news and some bad news. And I'm going to start off with the bad news. The bad news is I was going to tell you, I really wanted to tell you about the ecology of snow leopards, about their home ranges, dispersal behavior, breeding behavior, all this fascinating stuff, but I'm not. I'm not going to tell you that. Instead, the good news is what I'm going to do is share what snow leopards represent to us and to their environment. These cats are just awesome. Let's have a look at it. I mean, let's really have a look at it. They are so special where they the areas that they live, the highlands in, in the Himalaya, are absolutely wild and remote. And if you look at these long, luxurious tails that they have, <laughs> walking out in this wilderness area, they're uh, just really amazing. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I think that um, I was just going to say I was a little, little biased about the fact that I think they are, must be the most beautiful cat in the world. And um, the thing is that their beauty is complemented by the area that they live in, but also what they represent. They represent these large landscapes, they're far-ranging animals. They have these massive home ranges, and the only places that they exist have habitat that is intact, functioning ecosystems, and they need that. So we use that as a way of looking at these broad ecosystem services, really. Snow leopards highlight these amazing wild places. We can use snow leopards as a way of conserving these wild places because, you see, in these wild areas, you have all the prey that they need, like blue sheep or Himalayan tar as photographed here. Now, they also share the habitat with indigenous cultures, people that live in the most remote, crazy places, not high densities of people, but they share the habitat with these people ne nevertheless. And with, with that, sorry, um, we can find ways of protecting, protecting them. If we can protect the habitat that the snow leopard is in, if we focus on the snow leopard as an animal that we can protect, then essentially we're protecting their prey and we're dealing with, you know, we're ensuring that the people that are living in those areas are also happy. So they're living in harmony with, with their environment. No, no issues. But there are issues. It's not all hunky-dory. We're sitting with situations where 
you know, there, there clearly are conflict issues where you have livestock, you're going to have, you're going to have problems. It's an age-old thing, really. The, the threat to livestock, when you, when you look at what this means to indigenous people, livestock in these mountain areas is their currency. They, they rely on it for food, they rely on it for, for money. Kashmir is a big, big thing. So China is importing more and more Kashmir from these areas. And what, what happens then? I mean, we can put two and two together and see if you need more Kashmir, you're going to have more livestock. You have more livestock and you end up with overgrazing of habitat. You end up with your snow leopards wandering around there going, where are the blue sheep? Where are the tar? Where are the marmots? So, it happens, you know? Snow leopards go, mm, it looks like an easy thing to eat over there. What is it, a goat? They've been domestic goat. They've been around for about, what, 9,000 years? Wouldn't mind one of those. And you have these depredation events. Man, that's... It's a slaughter. That's um, called surplus killing or a mass depredation event. We had an incident about a month ago, a report from Nepal, where one snow leopard went into a corral and killed 97 goats in one night. All right, 97 goats, and then the next night came in and killed another seven. That's 104, if my maths is okay. And, um, you know, you can imagine people get pretty, pretty emotional about that, and it's a, it's a major loss to these people. It's their, it's their livelihood. It's their currency, these goats. So what results is you have retaliatory killing where these animals are killed because they've killed their livestock, but you also have other reasons why why snow leopards are threatened. And this is why the work that we're doing is so important when you consider these threats. Snow leopards are killed for their skins, that over there, um, as an economic incentive. So suddenly they, they've been offered money for, for, um, for, the, for the pelts of these, these animals. There's also another trade, and that is in body parts. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the fact that tiger, tiger body parts have been used around the world, sold to China and some, some of the Asian countries. And um, you know, tigers are quite rare now, so you know, people are importing lion bones and leopard bones and snow leopard bones. So there's a demand for these leopards, uh, snow leopards to, to be um, killed and then bo uh, body parts and that's sold around the world. So these threats are common across snow leopard range. 12 countries, we're looking at about 500,000 square miles. Big area covering Russia, Mongolia, Nepal, Bhutan, all these exotic places where there are these high mountains, wherever there are high mountains. And the Snow Leopard Conservancy has worked to find ways of conserving these cats, but also conserving their habitat, their environment, working with communities. And for us, it's been really important to recognize cultural heritage and indigenous peoples and work with them, to understand the needs of the community, to really know what is it that they need, they're not you know, coming in from like grassroots level and seeing, okay, you know what, maybe focusing on snow leopards right now is not the thing. Possibly vaccination of their yaks or their livestock to ensure that they're healthy would make people more amenable to the idea of protecting these animals. We consider that research is a fundamental and core part of what we have to do. You know, without knowledge, 
how do we make decisions? So we need to make these decisions. We need, uh, we need to do this research to, to have some kind of foundation on which to work and base whatever we claim that we're doing on. And it allows us to monitor and evaluate our programs in a better way and really know what's, what's going on. So these, for instance, the use of camera traps here. It's one research technique. We also look at ways of involving the communities. Young people out there who are simply just, I mean, they live in the mountains, but they're not connected to these amazing animals living out here. So we get the youth, get them out there, show them how to use these camera traps, get them involved and engaged, and get them to see, get the photos at the end of the day and see you know, how many snow leopards did you get and who is it and some really cool stuff. So they love it and then suddenly there's a connection. Many of these people don't actually even really go out there to experience nature, the wilderness, the way we experience it. Our education goals as a whole, looking at education programs, we find ways of engaging with, with children and also not just children but adults. Herders, teaching them about human wildlife conflict, getting them to understand that, you know, if you do this to protect your goats, you know, then that's the right way to do it. So this is essential. We also look at finding innovative ways of, of making it economically viable for people to actually buy into this conservation model, if you like. So, can I sell you this idea that you know, snow leopards are worth more alive than dead? Can you get something out of it? The homestay programs that have been developed, for instance, where people open their homes up, and you as a tourist, a visitor, a guest in their country can go and stay there and really experience the cultures the way they are for very little. Amazing experiences. We'd love to do it on a higher end level. And then you look at the, the threats, the risks. And we now have mentioned it before, the depredation. <laughs> These... It's very easy for a cat to get into a corral like this, okay? So we found innovative ways or traditional ways of actually protecting these, these um, corrals. These are, this is what we do. This is what the Snow Leopard Conservancy does. And it's all to pres preserve and conserve this amazing cat. But there's something else here. And I want to just say this, that we've gone beyond simply looking at one, one species. It's really what that one species represents. And these mountain ecosystems we're looking at broader, using our knowledge and knowledge sharing to conserve mountain ecosystems using these iconic species like snow leopards. And for that matter, we've embarked on setting up a project in California working on pumas, mountain lions, right here in our backyard to show what amazing cats these are, engaging with communities and having people connect with these wild places, these wild mountains. And if there's one person that knows about wild places. I'd like to introduce you to a man who has been to some of the most incredibly wild places in the world, the founder of the Snow Leopard Conservancy, the first person ever to successfully study snow leopards in the world 35 years ago. And in my opinion, and many of my colleagues feel this way, one of the most humble and dedicated people in the conservation world, and a legend in big cat conservation in the world, Dr. Rodney Jackson. That's him when he was a youngster. Well, we'll move on. This is what I like. Um, let me put that up there. So I, I've decided this time I'm going to talk about what it takes to study snow leopards, a little bit of how I started, and how do you study a ghost, something you never see. So there's a snow leopard here. Some of you last year will probably pick it up, keep looking. But when I first started, Dal and I in 1980, it was the first study. We had some VHF radios. It was pretty primitive. We did not see the cats for a very long time. And I would come back and say, well, how many cats you've seen? Well, I'm studying them. I, they're around somewhere. 
And for those of you who can see, it's a camouflage, it's a habitat they live in. There's the snow leopard staring at us. And I know I've walked past them a few inches away many a time and, ne and never seen them. A rock falls and I see them run away. But our study in 1980, so 35 years ago now, was a, a cover of National Geographic, and you can read all about it in Dahler's book, but I just want to give you a sense, as we now move to the next decade with new uh, telemetry, new tools, a lot more knowledge, I guess, about these cats, how we want to go about it. This is how it started, and many things have not changed. So that pile of uh, garbage behind the aircraft there is all our food, for six months. We had a peanut butter jar. It had to last two months. There were six of us, so you know, you didn't get a lot. A, a chocolate square a week. The priority was scientific equipment. And we had to walk 12 days to get to our study area. Now even nowadays, we still gotta go a long way. And most of our work is above 10,000 feet, up to 16. There's a lot of snow, it's cold, you're living in a tent, there are no houses, no research stations in most of these places. And to get there, of course all your supplies, they come on the back of the axe. This is one of the high pass routes we followed in uh, to the mountain opposite where Peter Matheson wrote about, using yaks to carry all the loads, all people. This is what really got me when we came to this point, because from here we had to cross over this cliff which the local people call drop plate. And they call, I asked them, drop plate, what the hell does that mean? Oh, well, my plate fell out of my uh, doko and went tumbling down into the river there. And all I could think is, God, we don't want drop dollar or drop rod in that river. <laughs> and it was incredible. I was, you know, I'm not a mountain climber, but I had to learn to do that. I, Dala learned to do that. We all had to do that. We still have to do that to get into snow leopard areas. And you want to go high. You want to stay in campsites like this where you've got great views because cats like ridge lines. They like to look down at you. And if you get them in the early morning, you see them walking up the ridge lines. Uh, if you've got telemetry, of course, it's a lot easier. The big thing in those days was mail. So this is before satellite phones, fax machines. And our mail will come once every three months with a runner, a whole pile of aerograms that we would sit up all night reading, that uh, the aerograms went back in another form for Dahler's book. So that's changed. Now we have satellite phones. Uh, we have uh, all sorts of communication. We know what's going on. People know what's going on with us. So we studied these five cats. We learned a lot about them, uh, their movements. I won't go into all of that now. But now we have the new technology of satellite collars, proximity collars, so you can have it set off an alarm when a snow leopard came to a certain place and you could really study its food habits, uh, what it's hunting, its hunting sequences and so on. You still have the problem of getting around in the study area. So here's my associate before Quinton, and I don't look at this Quinton, this was Gary, and we had to put a cable bridge across these rivers because, you know, I didn't think too much. Monsoon, what happens in monsoon? A hell of a lot of water comes down there. And those rivers, those bridges, just log bridges are gone. So we had cable bridges. Now, 35 years later, and I can't believe how quickly time goes, but we want to go back to this area. This area was famous made very famous by Peter Matheson's book, The Snow Leopard, I think m many of you may have read it. Uh, and this is Ringmo Lake, I think one of the most beautiful lakes in the world. It's about 13,000 feet. And behind that mountain, the other side of the mountain, is where we worked in the 1980s and did that first study. There was National Geographic story. I want to come back to this monastery. Peter spent a lot of time there. He never saw a cat, they saw a lot of signs. So this is the Shea Hermitage, it's a very famous hermitage, and you can just sense snow leopards all around there. I mean, every life is, you can walk up to blue sheep almost, because people have protected them for so long. So I think this is a great place to do a study, to get back and look at Tibetan culture. This is more Tibet than Tibet, I think, really, in Dalpo. But there are some threats that are emerging, and threats we need to deal with called 
Tibetan gold. So you see all the gold there, so they look like caterpillars or something, and they are. What they are is a combination of a caterpillar and a fungus. And the fungus is living off the caterpillar. And these are far more valuable than gold, actually, and it's become a huge livelihood across the Tibetan plateau. Now, the strange thing about it, these things grow just a few inches above the ground, and, and you harvest them in the monsoon in June, July, and it really takes uh, young kids like this guy to be able to see them, because you've know, got to have good eyes, and you're crawling on the ground on these grasslands, picking this up, knowing that in your hand, you probably have something that is going to give you enough funds for a whole year. So they collect it. They disturb wildlife, thousands of people out here. So what we want to do is go back and put on the satellite collars as we did a few years ago in Mongolia with this tall good uh, cat and really get good detail on how humans and snorlapers interact. Do, in the Yosagampa, do they avoid uh, certain areas in summer? What does that mean? And we can get in a year very easily all the movements of the snorlapper, where they've gone, uh, their interactions with one another, so this is the kind of studies I think Quinton was talking about us doing long term. And we can match it now with camera traps. Camera traps are so wonderful, they're easy. They get us all sorts of data on other cats. Well, here, a snow leopard with her cubs. And reproduction, obviously, is a critical thing. And, and recruitment to the population as it has declined in the past. And I think beginning to come back. In fact, I think many snow leopard populations are either stable or slightly increasing which is a good sign. We can use non-invasive techniques. So genetics, I think, is really going to be the future. This is a lab. You've got to go to the field, boots on the ground. You have to do that. You collect the scats. You can come back, and you get a lot of information, especially on the maternal side. But you can identify, obviously, the gender, uh, the individuals. We can count cats a lot easier from collecting their scats, and we can sit in out there putting a camera out for three months and going to identify, because obviously, you know, cats are moving in many areas, and it's hard to have enough cameras out. But you always come back to the human-wildlife conflict side of things. <laughs> and this wonderful little box here that I got is a, actually a solar-powered fox light. So Cats get into these corrals, and we're looking for simple, cheap devices that we can put near the corrals that would discourage a snow leopard from coming close. And Ian Whalen, who's an Australian, invented this, and he came to me, had this big device like this that has a big battery, and well, those batteries are hard to find overseas, and he came up with a solar one. And these, I think, could have value all over the world in where you've got Animals, uh, predators coming into livestock especially, because they operate during the night with the flashing lights irregularly. And what we want to do is obviously make happy people, because happy people are going to protect snow leopards. We can predator-proof the corrals, as is done here, but it's relatively expensive. We can bring in tourism, and I think this is really what we want to in do in DOLPA with our new program, and we welcome you to join us there but we want to do a really intensive landscape level st uh, study with mitigation, getting people out to see snow leopards as you can in Ladakh these days. Uh, just a quick word, there's a lot of things keep happening. As you well know, a few months ago there was a catastrophic earthquake in, in Nepal, and it occurred. this is in Mount Everest actually, in one of our study areas where we have a savings and credit group working. And I think it's a good time, but they have to rebuild. Uh, that's, you know, people don't think of conservation when you don't have a home. So challenges happen, but I really feel if we can work with the local communities and give them the tools to become more self-sufficient, give them some livelihood knowledge so they live in with activities that are amenable to the land, tourism, I think, when controlled, <coughs> could be one of these then people and snow leopards together can have a future. This cub, I, in many of you have seen this picture of a, uh, two cubs, uh, actually nearly independent cats in hammers, walking along a livestock trail. And this is the future. We want more cats out there. We want them over a wider area. 
We want them crossing international borders. We have 12 countries that snow leopards live in. And if snow leopards can come and clean your lens out there, I welcome them. Let them come. <laughs> It's so hard to believe that this is literally, there's a village just below where these cats are. This is about 14,000 feet. And this village, when I, we first went there, really saw snow leopards as a very despised species. They just wanted them eliminated totally. Now they are central and their livelihoods are much better. They more or less doubled their income, which I think is great. So come and join us. We welcome you. Um, we're hoping that this will be a project that National Geographic has expressed interest in it. Going back to Dolpo after 35 years, and my goal is mentoring the next generation. So I can take a few questions. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you.